my uh, task today is to uh, give you a kind of a sampling of what's happening around the world and uh, leave you uh, all ready to listen to the rest of the presentations which will be in detail about the California project. I, uh, I'd like to ask first, how many of you have kids? Jana? Yes. How many of you have grandchildren? <laughs> that, that's an age issue, I think. Uh, the, uh, if you are not concerned about climate change, then you don't have a head. You don't have any any brain to think with. Uh, my, uh, I was recently listening to a presentation by uh, Defense Secretary Bill Perry, who is the, one of the world's most concerned people about nuclear uh, proliferation. And he was, he said, very frankly, he said, as much as I've worked my life to combat nuclear armament and proliferation, he says the biggest threat to uh, humanity <coughs> and to mammalian species on the earth right now is climate change. And that's something coming from one of the world's most renowned scientists and statesmen. And I think he's right. So let me give you a quick scan as to why we're doing this. And then let's look at, uh, at um, what's being done. Uh, California has created about 40 million people. <coughs> By mid-century, a little after mid-century, we'll be at about 65 million people. Uh, that's, uh, that's like dropping the state of New York into California. We can't do that uh, with the current infrastructure we have to support our, our population. We can't do it with our water. Uh, we can't do it with our transportation. Uh, both of those things are at crisis levels now. You had 25 million people and we're out of business. But it's going to happen. You can't put walls up. It's going to happen. So we better be ready. Now, let's, uh, let's see what that population is doing. This was the front page up above the fold, right-hand column, the prestige location in the New York Times, one of the fine newspapers of the world, uh, two years ago. It indicates that uh, the climate change uh, precursors, CO2 concentrations, parts per million in the atmosphere, were twice as high as they have ever been in the history of the world, eight hundred last eight hundred thousand years is what they could obtain in the ice corings in the Antarctica and in the sediment in the Pacific. And this was corroborated by several different uh, teams uh, doing the measuring. Twice as high as ever in eight hundred thousand years. Four times as high as the average in the last eight hundred thousand years. And it isn't a trend; it's a spike going straight up. And it's only gotten worse. So, what's causing this? This is this is the end of the world as we know it. It's it's the it's the, uh, it's the uh, next uh, evolution of Earth if we don't stop it. Well, this uh, research is done by Stanford University, including a group of Nobel laureates, uh, cooperating from around the world, and they concluded that 38 uh, percent of the problems coming from transportation. In California, it's more like 43% because of our addiction to automobiles and petroleum. The next problem is industry, and uh, industry is being attacked very well now by our president uh, and by, uh, by our governor in terms of uh, cleanup of the uh, environment. So our job, our concern at this topic today is transportation. Roughly 40% of the greenhouse gases are coming from transportation. Well, what kind of transportation? Cars. Almost 200 uh, grams of CO2 per kilometer mile, this is the international measurement, are coming uh, come from cars. Airline traffic, if you include them all, is not nearly as bad as cars, pretty bad. But when you look at only short hop airlines, which is what high speed railway places, then you recognize that it's as bad as a car. The pollution per seat mile is as bad 
as being in a car if you're riding a short hop airline, which is what is replaced around the world now by high speed rail. Buses are not super. Ed, <laughs> buy electric buses. So buses are not great, but they're a lot better than driving alone in a car. And if you happen to have electric trolley buses, like San Francisco has a lot of, or the new generation of electrically powered buses, then you get way down there into the next category, which is the steel wheel on rail electric systems, which are the least polluting systems in the world. They're also the most efficient to operate in terms of cost. Light rail, commuter rail, metro rail, and high speed rail being the most efficient, least polluting form of transportation that we currently have available to humankind. Okay, let's look at what's happening around the world. By the way, it's, it's mind boggling to me that we are the richest state and the richest nation that the world has ever known. And we're being told that we can't afford a high speed rail system when all of these other countries have operating high speed rail systems. They built them, some of them invented them, they're operating them. Almost all of them operate at a profit after oper operating and maintenance costs. But we're told that we can't afford it. Well, we're told that we can't afford it by the same scientists that told us that smoking didn't cause cancer and that uh, petroleum didn't cause air pollution. <laughs> Japan, an outstanding system. 50 years old now, 51 years old. Four different private companies operate the system in Japan. Each one of them operates at a profit. These, the country of Japan built it, just as California is building theirs, and they franchised it out to private companies. Private companies are sold on the stock market. They make a, a dividend for their stockholders every year. There's their 200 mile an hour train. Korea, a fine new system. There's their 200 mile an hour train. Uh, Taiwan, a newer system, uh, having a little trouble penetrating the market. They built their, their, uh, their terminals out in the pasture lands because it was cheaper. And they found that cows don't ride high speed rail. And uh, they're, uh, they're now infilling around the stations and doing much better. That's their 200 mile an hour train. They're one of the only uh, systems in the world that doesn't make a profit after operating and maintenance. China's the 900 pound gorilla, uh, 140,000 miles of rail, all being upgraded to electrically powered systems. They already have 8,000 kilometers of that that are at 230 miles an hour. And they're uh, quickly developing another 11,000 uh, miles of that that will be at 140 miles per hour, both freight and passenger. That's their 230 mile an hour train and an accident a couple of years ago wasn't the train's fault, it was the operator's fault, or the dispatcher's fault. Uh, but uh, that's a fine system. Europe, uh, that's their 2025 master plan, which they're already well advanced in completing. Spain especially is near completion of their system. As you can see, it's going to bind that huge economic giant together in one system, and they're going to beat our pants unless we can get people to, uh, to work and product to the market in a competitive way. That's the French AGV, their 200 mile an hour train. That's the German uh, trains, the lower right hand side is 200 miles an hour. Uh, that's the Italian train, I, I'm Italian so I <coughs> take a little pride there. Uh, when it was uh, franchised out uh, last year, two years ago, to a corporation run by the chair of the board of Ferrari, uh, he immediately repainted the, the, the trains. It makes them go faster if they're red. <laughs> the, um, the Spanish system is outstanding. It's uh, rapidly expanding. It's now the second only to China. Over 5,000 kilometers of high-speed rail and uh, it rapidly expanding. Turkey has a high-speed train. How could Turkey have a high-speed train and, and America not have a high-speed train? Russia is uh, in the process of developing 
that 230 mile per hour train for the 8,800 kilometer run from Moscow to Kazan. And we're sitting back trying to build our first link. Well, there's our high speed rail map in America. The blue lines are 140 mile an hour incremental upgrade systems. It will be both freight and passenger. The, the green lines are the true high speed uh, 200 mile an hour plus systems. Northeast quarter, Florida, Texas T-Bone, the, uh, the uh, route from Kansas City up to Chicago, and of course our system in California. Uh, several of those were ahead of us. Texas, Florida were ahead of us in the planning process and they elected uh, governors of a different party than had been in control at the time. <clears throat> and uh, the new party decided that they didn't want to do high-speed rail. And so now California is ahead of them and receiving their money to build our system. And that's just too bad. We'll take it. And uh, at the same time, we realize that we have to build high-speed rail all around the country in order to have a network at some time in the distant future. So let's focus on California. I'm not going to do anything more than flash that pretty map at you because Ben Traposis is going to tell you about the California system and he knows it um, from being in Northern California, uh, Deputy Director for uh, the program here. And uh, we appreciate you being here. So um, the route, as you can see it, uh, uh, goes from Sacramento to San Diego, from San Francisco uh, into that system. Um, in the area of uh, Chowchilla by Madrid, and there's a little portion that goes on down to Anaheim. The first section will be from Anaheim up through LA, uh, over the high desert uh, into the Central Valley, and then uh, over the Pacheco Pass from the uh, area of Madrid, uh, Madera, and then uh, through Gilroy, and then up through San Jose, and uh, along the Caltrain system, and we'll hear from the general manager, uh, Jim Hartnett, of Caltrain today, and we're very fortunate to have Jim here. Thank you very much. The last thing to, to share with you is that a high-speed rail system by itself will not work. It's not worth building. Uh, you have to have the people near the stations in order to make it work. And you have to have good feeder distribution systems. Uh, this is what's called a transit village. It's a classic one. There's all sorts of other ways of doing it. But this, the idea here is to put a podium over the parking and over the station area. And on top of that podium have nothing except uh, not, no motorized vehicles, grass, and uh, high-rise living that's juxtaposed so that they're not directly adjacent to each other, but rather that you have under, everybody has a sight line, but you go up as high as you can in order to stack as much as you can on top of that facility so people commute to work in the future will be to take the elevator to their bottom floor, drop the kids off, drop off your laundry, and uh, take the elevator on down to the station, take that station, uh, that rail uh, line, light rail, commuter rail, uh, uh, might be a uh, bus rapid transit system uh, to where you work, and, uh, and then reverse that at night. That's the way it's done around the world. We don't do it here because we're addicted to automobiles. We've got to get off that addiction if we're going to continue to sustain ourselves as an economic uh, force in the world, and we, uh, we have to do it quickly. We also have to do it for our children uh, if we intend to see this, this planet continue to be livable by mammals. Oh, cockroaches, I love it. Don't worry about the cockroaches. They, they like the heat, and, and they've lived through several different uh, uh, complete changes in, in the living species on Earth. But human, being, human beings won't make it uh, unless we change this very quickly. And what you've just seen is a scan of the primary linchpin device to make the change. The rest of the countries are doing it. We've got to catch up. I think I'll pause now and, and uh, do you want to take questions now? Sure. Yes. Okay. The boss says uh, we can take a few questions. Make sure we stay on the side. Do you have any questions or thoughts or you want to throw something? Uh, yes. So, it's Rod, you presented an overview of systems around the world. And uh, I'm just wondering if uh, there are any lessons 
that can be learned from what the 50 <coughs> years of international experience with high speed rail has been for the United States? You know, are there specific things that we can learn from what these other systems have shown us? Andy, I think, uh, I think the lessons are, are, are simply that it can be done. It can be done in a place with terrible earthquake problems like Japan. It can be done in areas that have massive mountain structures and barriers like Europe and the Alps. It can be uh, done in areas with vast stretches of open space like China. And so there's no reason why we can't do it except for our will to make it happen. We have the money. You can't tell me California doesn't have the money to build a rail system or, or a water system if we need it, whatever, whatever it is. We're a very wealthy state. It's a matter of having the will to do it. Uh, so uh, uh, that's the lesson. Now, in terms of which <coughs> of those lessons apply in California, I think we have to be awfully careful about determining that we think it's this way and therefore it ought to be this way. That's why the Federal Railroad Administration has guided California through 10, no, 10, 20 years now, Ben, 96 to 2016's worth of environmental alternative analyses and environmental clearances. And every aspect of this system in California has been subject to alternative analyses and the selection of the best alternative and then the environmental clearance on that best alternative. So we aren't guessing anymore as to what's best in California. We know uh, what's best among those things that can be afforded and are implementable. <clears throat> and it's a matter now of stop talking about what you should do. Take what the environmental clearance has given us and, and the alternative analysis have given us and build them. Uh, so we, we're, we're beyond, we're way beyond in California the process of of thinking about what we ought to do. That's been decided legally by a process that's been adopted by Congress, NEPA, and it's been done according to the strict procedures required for <coughs> environmental clearance, and it's been certified. So it's time now to fish or cut bait. And by golly, we've got to fish and build this system. So, yeah, I'm very glad that California is really starting building high speed rail. But how transferable do you think that California's success will be <coughs> to the rest of the country? Like more specifically, I think in, in Texas they are trying to build a high speed rail connecting Dallas and Houston, but the culture there I and mean, the reform is sort of very different than the, that in California. So how transferable do you think or what other approaches do you think that they need to take? to make has a real success in the other part of the country. All right, let me, uh, let me get into some, some uh, risky area here. Um, the Mineta Transportation Institute is a nonpartisan, non-political institute. And I want to stress that. Uh, if the Obama administration have not lost control of Congress, we would have high-speed rail projects under construction in Texas, Florida, the Northeast Corridor would be upgraded, and the Chicago system would be under construction. That's a fact. We would have, we would have PREA uh, uh, renewed, reauthorized, which was the funding, uh, $10 billion of funding for uh, actually, it was more like uh, ultimately $14 billion of funding for high-speed rail projects. All of that came to a screeching hot halt when uh, the control of Congress was shifted away from Mr. Obama's party at the end of his second year, and he could no longer find support for or funding for virtually any capital project. I believe that will change. I don't believe the American people are ready to be a second-class country. And when that changes, the California example will, uh, will be the only example that the nation can see. Ours will be the only system where there are tracks on the ground and there are trains on tracks and 
people operating maintenance facilities and operators going to training programs and new technology being pursued, it will be the model for, for America. And uh, I'm very convinced of that and hopeful. Yes? Yeah, hi, Rod. Hi, Kirk. Um, so I'm sort of going to piggyback on the gentleman's question. Um, now, he asked how transferable <coughs> California is going to be to other systems. But if you look at the Dallas to Houston system, I mean, it's a completely different model. Rather than being state, initially state funded, it's, it's funded by the same company that I believe built the Shinkansen. Um, it seems to me that in, especially with, like you mentioned, those Republican governors that were really quick to give back. I didn't say that. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, mention, I'll mention that there are at least three Republican governors that, that gave back the grants that for, okay, that their um, predecessors, who were Democrats, had won. Um, but it's, it's interesting, though, that Texas, which is not exactly blue, a blue state, they're, they're going full throttle with this Dallas to Houston. Let me, let me answer it. your question, Eric, because it's, it's a good question. The, the person who runs the Texas, has run the Texas effort uh, for the last uh, 15 years, is uh, Judge uh, Eccles. Judge Robert Eccles, he was a member of the County Board of Supervisors in Harris County. Uh, we were friends before uh, transportation things. And he just became enthused about High Street Rail, convinced, as am I, that it's the right thing to do. And he's been leading the charge down here. Uh, and we, we've gone to each other's events and given cheering cheerleader speeches to each other and so on. So I, I, I know what's happened to him. Their original project, which was ahead of ours, uh, was to have the, the plan that I showed you. Uh, they're, they're pursuing just a little tiny portion of this now. But this whole text, what was called the Texas T-Bone, uh, was to be built uh, in the 1990s. They had the plans done, they had the right-of-way identified, and they had some funding. It was under uh, Governor Richards at the time. And boy, was she a hard charger. <clears throat> it was ready to go ahead. And it was going ahead, though, with government building the, the system and then franchising it out as Japan and, and many other uh, countries have done. Uh, that ended when the person who became governor after Governor Richard uh, uh, took office. Uh, it has languished since that time. They've gone through a half a dozen models of, of attempt. They had partial fe uh, uh, government funding. They had only federal funding for a while. Uh, and that was cut off uh, because the governor gave the money back. And uh, as a result now, they're trying to build a little short segment. Uh, I think it's less, it's about 100 miles, 90 miles. And it's in the median of a freeway. It's, it's adjacent to and then the median of a freeway. And it really won't be a very good example of high-speed rail. It'll be very difficult to, uh, to attract a lot of ridership to that little short piece of system at the time. So we're, we're about out of time, but Texas, though they would like to be a good example, are not, have not been allowed to be a good example. We will be the shining example. And uh, as long as we can get this built, uh, yeah, we'll be the model for the nation. And uh, the person who's going to tell us how we're going to do that is going to speak next. I'll uh, sit down and thank you all for being here, and thank you. For